<laughs> it's the tinting that's why I'm red. With the video camera. Uh, I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> I've got one. I'm making one for you too, Jeff. You'll oh, be no, don't bother. <laughs> oh no, no. You're You'll never just... top that one. You can never top that one. Oh, just wait. You think there's a bottomless well in my brain? No, no, no. There is <laughs> when you get to the bottom, that's the start of the next well. Okay. Right. Um, everyone, I'm very excited to bring back our favorite two guests on the planet human, Jeff Snyder, Emil Kalinowski. Um, I am a big fan. I know you have a lot of big fans. Um, yeah, that's it. What's going on? Uh, Emil, what's going on in your life? I, uh, I'm reading two sci-fi novels. I just finished Ring World, which I've been meaning to read for 20 years. I finally did it. And then I'm reading Forever War right now, and it's pretty good. And I'm also working out and I'm helping the local community because we had a green iguana problem, but not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, any green iguana problems in your in your uh, neck of the woods? No, we're a little sad here today. We lost our kitty cat, who was oh, no. today's his twentieth birthday, and he, he had that was that was enough for him. So we're a little bit a uh, little bit downbeat here in West Palm Beach. It's kind of like cats. I, I've been a cat person my whole life. And uh, I have these uh, servo links hybrids, and they're very interesting because they imprint with one or two people, and then they absolutely hate everyone else. <laughs> and so, to everyone else, they're the worst animal on earth. But to right. you, they're the. It's like a, a child that's furry. Uh, right. But losing a cat is like losing. It's it may be worse than losing a human child because you can make another human child. <laughs> but a cat, that's that's eternity. So that's a tough one, but you know what? You know, the cat is dead. The cat is dead. Long live the new cat. You know, in, in a few months, you'll be ready. You'll bring in a new kitty, and then the whole world changes. Yeah, not yet, though. Not yet, though. It's still a little raw. <laughs> you have to agree. You're right. I mean, you spent 20 years with, with the guy. It's, you know, it's, he's a part of your life. So it, it's, it's, you can't, you can't just uh, turn it on and off. But I think you're right. Eventually, we'll, we'll, we'll look for somebody else who will never replace him, but be a, in, in addition. There is a company where you can replace him. They will take, oh, really? they will take the DNA and they will clone him. We've seen, oh, we've read this story. I think it was in some religious tome. I think it was pet cemetery. I think it was in <laughs> Leviticus. This isn't, do not go down this road, Jeff. <laughs> I will tell you all about it later. Do not go down this road. <laughs> it's, it's there's the tried. one place you can bury the pets, but don't go past the wood pile. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a haunted space somewhere. <laughs> So let's talk about the greater financial world. Um, so Emil, I think you wanted to lead off. We were thinking um, Paul Krugman had some interesting comments recently. Do you want to kind of give us some background? I do, but do you mind if I first ask the big question that you're in day to day, you're working on it. So you probably, it's like Jeff being asked about reserves. So you're probably going to be annoyed, but nevertheless, I'm going to ask you the question that's been on everybody's mind who doesn't check in daily Last time we talked was April 26, and at that time, Bitcoin, using that as a proxy for the wider crypto market, was at, let's see, what does this say, 54,000. Today, right now, 37,000. Is this normal, expected? Is it the end? I'm looking at a chart over here that I printed out, and it shows that Bitcoin has collapsed in its history, 43%, 56%. 83%, 87%, 84%, 60, 50. And those are the big ones. Yeah. So there's it's a lot normal. Of, there's a lot of little 35ers in there that yeah, you don't even right. see. <laughs> so what, what are we to think broadly? So broadly, I think the way to look at this space is you have illiquid assets on illiquid exchanges being traded by non-veteran or non-experienced traders that have been given way too much leverage and not enough education on, on the downside of leverage. And what we're seeing is these the harsh effects of cascading liquidations and, and they're tiers of liquidations. So first you have, so like, let's say Jeff, I said, hey, there's a market where someone with 16 minutes of experience can get 125X leverage. <laughs> one, might, one might think that that's too much, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's... A little bit. It's giving a machine gun to a five-year-old and saying, don't use all the bullets, right? And, and so it's just – so it's the perfect 
recipe for complete and total annihilation. And well, so what happened? There's, there's bad incentives all the way around, right? I mean, the yep. people who are giving out the leverage are, they have no incentive to not do it. They have no incentive to intermediate where they, where they normally would. Right. And these liquidations, people don't realize they're great for exchanges. Yeah. Because a lot, you know, down. the fish, the fish prosper where the water is murky. <laughs> and and <laughs> so a lot, you know, a lot goes on on these exchanges that that you do see and mostly that you don't see when these prices are bouncing around and people get liquidated out of positions, especially on derivatives exchanges that have no real regulation where they can tell you what the price was. They can exit you out of your position and 16 minutes later, the price is right back up and they're like, well, yeah, but you're out. So those positions are null and void and the exchange just scrapes all those uh, options premiums they were going to have to they were going to have to pay out. So it's very interesting, a lot of the mechanics, but I think it just boils down to illiquid assets on illiquid exchanges by inexperienced traders. And then compound that with the last six months where we saw Bitcoin go. If you go seven months back, you have a, an $18,000 Bitcoin that went up to $65,000. Some would say that's not, that might be too fast, <laughs> right? And it, it's great on the way up and we're like, woo, woo, we're rich. And then when it gives up a couple of months of gains, these things blow up all of a sudden. So people get, you know, over enthusiastic. They start going deeper into leverage. They, and so one of the things that I saw a lot was other than the 125X leverage that's extended on some of these exchanges, which is just completely negligent. You also had a lot of people borrowing against Bitcoin to buy more Bitcoin, to borrow against that Bitcoin and buy more Bitcoin. And they leverage it all the way on down. Now, in an options play, you can do that because you have a fixed, you, you, you know what your losses are. Your losses are the potential gain. You could know. So, for instance, I could sell calls against Bitcoin, take the take the premium, buy more Bitcoin, take the premium, sell it, buy more Bitcoin. I could leverage that out because I know at the end of the day, I'll either have cash or Bitcoin. I'm willing to accept that. You can't get into a negative position doing something like that. If you borrow against the Bitcoin to buy more Bitcoin, you've just you've just extended by that percentage your risk. Right. And so you've taken something that already is really, really risky. That's doing 200, 250 percent year on year. You're taking that amount of risk and compounding it by borrowing it. So now it's levered risk. And then you lever the leverage and lever the leverage. And it pretty soon starts to sound like some of the nonsense we see in the legacy financial system. And so yeah, which is not surprised. I mean, look, it, this kind of thing is it's human nature, right? That's really what we're talking about. It's not that, you know, these are new things or new developments. This is what we see in every kind of every financial bubble from the time from the beginning of time. And I think what's driving Bitcoin and digital and all these other things over the last, you know, as you pointed out, uh, Nick, since October, really, is the oh, the dollar's dead. The dollar here it is. Finally, we've been hearing about the dollar crash, and here it comes. Inflation's going through the roof, and everybody said, "Well, what do we do? Let's buy some Bitcoin because that's what we hear. That's 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 going to be the one that survives the dollar's death." And that's you know, you're right. Lack of education, the narrative, the ideas, all these things have, have combined into probably the worst sort of, of self reinforcing feedback loop. And then, as an asterisk, add on the GameStop community that's been here oh, yeah. collecting couch money, staring at their computer right. or their phone, and getting their their investment uh, ideas from TikTok. Yeah, it's almost it's almost like a drug. It's addictive, right? What's the next big score? I don't care what it is or if it makes sense. It's I'm just a trader. You know, it's it's you know we saw this stuff 25 years or 20 years ago, 25 years ago now. Day traders, they were they were trading dot com stocks. They were utterly worthless, and it didn't matter because that was the big thing. And everybody, you know, you got you got paid for for doing nothing. Yeah, it's it's incentivized bad behavior, isn't it? Yeah, it's it really is, and and there's you know there's no. There's no self um, self checks in, involved in the system. There's no way to stop and say, "Look, this is not working. We need to limit this." You know, the, you know, organic ways of interrupting these processes before they get out of control. And you know, again, uh, you know, it's always a combination of factors. It's always a bunch of stuff combining in the just the right way, where everybody just is herded all at once into these things without even thinking. And then, again, as you point out, like, there's no incentive to think about it. Just act. Just 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 make just make your money and get your high. Nick, what about the broader crypto space? Bitcoin is not all encompassing. What about the other coins? Have they all followed suit? Have they all done the Peter Pan off the ledge, or are we so, seeing strength in some 
that's perhaps indicative of uh, something fundamental underlying it. The infrastructure plays the protocol layers. So um, think of you know Ethereum and Cardano, Polkadot, Near. Some of these these protocol layers where future DApps and applications will be laid on top of. They're actually doing quite well. And in the big run up they had, where Bitcoin, you know, over the last say twelve to fifteen months has gone up about three hundred and fifty percent, depending on where you mark the lows. Right? I know there's a lot of you can be real clever and find the lowest point last year and go from there and go to the. But if you look at the aggregate, Bitcoin's about 350 percent, you know, kind of this year, you know, to last. But some of these protocol layer assets are up, you know, 20 or 30 X. And I think that the crypto community and, and then newer investors that are coming into the space that are taking the time to do the research and read white papers and, and look at the legacy system and, and which of these assets might alleviate frictions or pain points in the legacy system, you know, whether it's contract settlement or, or you know, two or three party repo and, and, you know, finding ways to kind of ease frictions with these blockchain scenarios. I think you see a lot of infrastructure investing and it, and it gets back to those, you know, people are buying the highways right now. And some of the dApps go way up and then they implode. And, you know, Bitcoin has its its vacillations, but it's kind of in its own little orbit. But these protocol layers have gone up and they gave up a little bit of their gains maybe the last week or two. But they but they they rebuilt instantly, like even even Sunday when people were panicking, these protocol layers started marching up again because people said this is too much too quick. The idiots have dragged these coins down. Veterans, smarter money came in and said, no, we're. These are quality assets. So you're starting to see these infrastructure plays look like kind of quality assets in the space. And it's coincidental that they are also the ones that pay dividends in the form of staking rewards. And I think a lot of people in their mind in the crypto space are saying, well, where's my bond market, right? Where's, where's my, there's no, there's nothing risk-free about crypto, but where is my easy money? And a lot of these protocol layers, they are proof of stake and they reward you for holding those assets and kind of in, in, and pointing them at, at different state pools and stuff. So there's just a lot of, I think, infrastructure buying going on right now. And that's actually really positive because this is the stuff that's going to build Web3 and eventually let the legacy financial system migrate over and utilize some, but not all of this kind of distributed ledger technology. Yeah, that's really the value, isn't it? It's in the technology rather than in the denominations of the various various methods. It's really, as you pointed out, it's the infrastructure stuff. And that's where all the interesting things are happening. And I think as long as you're patient and realize what you're getting into is not a tomorrow type of reward, if you can understand that this is a longer term trend, but it's a favorable trend and it's a longer term trend. And again, I guess that that, that sort of uh, works against the, the rational behavior, right? Because as soon as everybody else realizes this is the trend, they're going to jump on it. You miss out. And right. so there's always that, 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 you know, fear of missing out element to all of this. We just buy any digital thing, whatever, and hope that that's the one that wins out where I think Nick, you're pointing out that some of the smart money, quote unquote, they're looking more, looking at this more, more deeply in terms of real technology, real infrastructure, and really trying to think of, think ahead of solving real problems that exist today. And that's not an easy thing to do. And it's not an easy thing to say, OK, 15 years from now, this is the problem we have now. How can we how can we fix it down the road? It's it's in some ways it, it's it's almost appears to be a crapshoot. It's not. But it, it, it for somebody who's not really initiating the space, it really does look like I don't know. You know, you don't know what you're looking at. It's gambling. I mean, if we're being honest, most people coming into the digital asset space really don't know what they're looking at. And in my opinion, it's pure gambling. I mean, if you know, and you see that well, behavior. Yeah, what they're looking at is somebody's making a lot of money. Why isn't it me? Right. <laughs> I, I just want to chase. People this are just is a chasing. Hot asset. Let's yes. go for it. <laughs> they're just chasing price. Ooh, that's going up. So I yep. should own some of it. Yep. And that's always been a flawed kind of you know. The greater system. fool. It's always the greater fool, and you know, you always got to be careful when every when every hot market shows up. You know, are you going to be the one at the end of the line? And there's really no way of telling. But I think you're right, Nick. I love the way you're thinking about it because you're thinking about it more long term. There is value in digital and blockchain, all this stuff. There is tremendous value that um, it's hard to even explain what that value is to people who are not familiar with it. 
And I think too, Emil and, and Jeff, I think something should be said to the fact that this is an expanding new asset class. And unless you go back to the early formations of the bond market in the late 1600s, we haven't really seen a new asset class. So none of us really have a good system for imagining these kind of quasi logarithmic growth effects and, and where pools of new currency coalesce. Does that make sense? Because yeah, we haven't absolutely. seen this. No, it's, you know, in a lot of ways, it's the same stuff that has happened historically, but the way there's, you know, there's a 21st century spin on it that gives it a completely new and in many ways unexplored potential. And I think that's what's so attractive about it is, you know, people can feel there's something there, even if they don't know exactly what it is. And that's exactly what we say about, you know, the problems with the, mon the existing monetary system. It's again, it's a vague feeling there's something wrong. And there's a vague feeling that digital currency, there's something right. We have no idea how those two things are going to crash together because we don't know. It's impossible to predict. But we do, we have, you know, we I think most people have a sense that at some point, one one or the other has to give. Either the the legacy monetary financial system has to fix itself and right itself, which, you know, I'm not convinced <laughs> that's a, that's even a realistic possibility. Or it's got to transition to, to something else, and that something else is digital. And if digital and tech, blockchain technology was just a flash in the pan bad idea, it would have been it would have been rushed out of the system already. Instead, as you pointed out, Nick, it's expanding, it's growing, it's it's adding new features, it's adding new ideas, it's testing new ideas in real time. And so there's a robust mechanism right now that's that's taking place in the real world that has that is successfully being tested. And at some point, that has to become a realized value instead of just a potential value. And that's really, I think that's that's what drives most people who understand crypto and digital. They think, okay, there's potential value, and at some point it becomes real value, and you want to get there first. So, and I've got a question that I want to post to both of you guys because I don't understand exactly how familial these the prime broker dealers are with the Fed. I mean, I know they're, they they kind of talk, and there's a lot of crosstalk, but as far as business initiatives, so BNY Mellon helps a company like Fireblocks raise 143 plus million dollars to basically provide these bigger bank facilities and FIs with crypto custody. So before that deal happens, does BNY Mellon basically go to the Fed and say, we're doing this, we're going to put you on notice that we're doing it? Like they don't do this stuff secretly, right? Like they communicate, I'm guessing, with the Fed at some level. <laughs> Not always. <laughs> no. I mean, you, you go back to the housing bubble era. Most of what the banking system did, the Fed had absolutely no idea. And it's really if, if it's it's kind of if this is something that we like to do and it doesn't fall within, you know, the legal uh, the regulatory purview of either the Fed, the OCC or the FDIC. Those are the big three bank regulators. So long as there's no statute that requires um, any bank or any any financial institution to report, they're not going to. Because why would they? Well, so my thought was. You have BNY Mellon and Bank of America, which those are the top two on the 24, at least right now, as far as of the broker dealers, right? Working with the Fed as far, you know, assets under management and whatnot, or at least among the top. I know BNY Mellon is probably the, the biggest as far as well, assets. Nick, when you get into the asset management side, that's not the Fed at all. That's the SEC. But so, because they work, but because they work with the trade, because they are broker dealers for the Fed and they're, they're initiating. Separate business. Separate really? Businesses. So yes. it doesn't matter. So the asset management side has nothing to do with the broker dealer side. There's always supposed to be separation there. In, the, in a lot of cases, there actually is uh, because asset management is a completely different animal than securities and all the other stuff, the fun stuff, the money side, the money dealing stuff. And is that like the, the last little fragments of Glass-Steagall? Is that what that is, that kind of separation between investment side of the bank and, and kind of a, a treasury mechanism? It's not really Glass-Steagall as much as it is. It's very different business. I mean, taking care of an, an asset management is nothing like the money dealing. It's completely different. You're 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 providing essentially advice, mm. and that's really how it's treated. Whereas on the money dealing side, the security side, you're actually doing some real things. So okay, so you have uh, BNY Mellon. You know, Bank uh, Bank of America is now settling uh, certain transactions with stable coins. And so that got us all down the path of thinking, okay, when do U.S. regulators come in and step on stable coins? Because isn't that – isn't the whole idea of – you know, 
Jeff, you could spin up a stable coin tomorrow, Jeff, U.S. dollar. And Emil could have one on Thursday, you know, Emil, U.S. dollar. Isn't that essentially the same problem as the euro dollar problem? In in some respects, yes, but except that the euro dollar is quasi acknowledged. It's sort of, you know, benign neglect was always, we know banks are doing dollars out, outside the United States, but as long as they pay attention to U.S. regulations, as long as they pay attention to, you know, what the Federal Reserve does and demands, which before 2008 wasn't all that much, then it's sort of a, yes, this is a fake currency, this is a virtual currency, but it's quasi official. Whereas and if if I just showed up tomorrow with my own coin, you know, I, I don't think they would even care. Regulators wouldn't care. They would laugh at you. <laughs> right. But when that coin starts spreading out to exchanges and people start leveraging it, then then it becomes a thing. And the reason I bring that up is because <clears throat> it had been mentioned by Powell recently. You know, he basically said, you know, we're going to have to look at this stable coin thing um, as as they prepare. And then and then that led me to another question. <clears throat> In your opinion, does the Treasury issue a U.S. digital dollar or does the Fed do it? Because those are two different digital dollars in what could then happen. Well, I think they would be a joint joint partnership. And I don't know. I mean, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston is working with MIT's digital currency initiative right now, trying to come up with a quote unquote model central bank digital currency, which to me, I mean, you read the term sheet. It's just it makes you laugh. It just these people have no idea what they're talking about and no idea what they're doing. And so what they're really trying to do is recreate their payment system and calling it a digital currency when it, all it is is simply another form of accounting. It's not, you know, it's a central bank liability in the same way bank reserves are a central bank liability. It's really, or Federal Reserve notes, physical cash is a, is a central bank liability. And so they're really, they're not really doing a digital currency the way I think most people think of or should think of a digital currency. And the idea is just simply to try to pretend they're catching up to where the private market has been for a very long time already. They're like, look, this digital currency stuff, it didn't die out five, 10 years ago, whatever. It wasn't a fad. It wasn't a flash in the pan. Now, here we are 13 years after, you know, 12 years after the first Bitcoin block. The Finally, central banks are saying we better get into the digital space, but they're not really getting into the digital space. They're just trying to pretend that they are. And so that dovetails, I'm guessing that dovetails, Emil, into our discussion of, uh, of old citizen Paul Krugman. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, I was going to segue that way because, well, let's go to Paul Krugman. So Paul Krugman, what, what would he, we would consider him one of the establishment and he faintly praised Bitcoin with damnation recently on Twitter. He said, BTC is in a new innovation. It's been around since 2009. And in all that time, Nick Black, nobody seems to have found any good legal use for it. So he's addressing you directly. It's not a convenient medium of exchange, not a stable store of value. It's definitely not a unit of account. The value rests on the perception that it's technologically sophisticated and that you can protect yourself from inevitable collapse of fiat money, which is coming one of these days or maybe one of these centuries. Or as I say, libertarian derp plus techno babble. And here is where he finally says, well, all right. But I've given up predicting imminent demise. There always seems to be a new crop of believers. Maybe just think of it as a cult that can survive indefinitely. Let me share my screen. Am I going to be able to do it correctly? I have no idea. Here we go. I'm doing it right now. Can you guys see that? Okay. So this came out from Hedgeye this morning. And what it is is just... Uh, sentiment scoring of speeches by central bankers. I think maybe just the Fed. It's the number of times they're mentioning CBDCs. And so we see that like Mr. Krugman, you know, the, the, the trend is towards some sort of acceptance. And Jeff, that's what you were talking about right now. You were referencing an article that you wrote on the 14th of May at Real Clear Markets. It's called a, a half-baked attempt to pull banking back before it's too late. And that's where you were talking about those CBDCs and that they're trying to recreate what exists as opposed to leap forward into a new paradigm. 
Yeah, and I think it's interesting that I, I would agree with, Krog, with Krugman's assessment there because Bitcoin isn't a convenient medium of exchange right now. It isn't any sort, form of store of value with its price going fluctuating wildly, as you said, Emil. That's a that's an argue, that's a bet that's a strike against Bitcoin, if anything. And it's you know it isn't legal in a lot of places to use. So he's absolutely right about those things. And yet, and yet. Here we are 12 years later, and this the idea, its if, if not the, the usage of the Bitcoin, but the idea of cryptocurrency has only proliferated to the point that central bankers are thinking we need to copy what's going on in the marketplace. Otherwise, we're in danger of being completely left behind. So it's, it's it, as you pointed out, Emil, it's damning with faint, with, with faint praise, which is this thing is still here. I'm going to call them a cult. But the cult is growing. It's 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 flour it's flourishing. So you would think that people like that, and again, this this goes back to what are the CBD CBDCs? They're really about okay, what's really what's behind all of this? What is really trying to go on here? Why is there so much popularity in these things that we can't? No matter how much we badmouth them, and we're the monetary stewards, we're the monetary experts, and if we keep badmouthing them, and people go towards them anyway. You know, what is really going on with these things that creep, that, that uh, makes them so popular? And I have to believe, and I know, uh, Emil, maybe you think the same way, that at some point they're going to they're gonna have the aha moment, which is, hey, this current system doesn't work. And maybe people are exploring new alternatives because what we'd say is fine and working well actually is not. It's not a cult so much as it is, is a, a search for solutions when there is no alternate help available from the official channels. Jeff, you tell me because you read these academic studies more often than I do, <laughs> but <fun>. it's <laughs> it goes without saying, but it seems to me like there's been more of the, like you said, the aha moments, we're talking about studies that are poking holes in this belief system and they seem to be, uh, there seems to be more of them recently. The collateral one, the global savings glut. I can't remember them all. Yeah, but there's the a lot New of Zealand that have been QE. perpetuated for a long time that have been debunked just in the last, debunked in the official channel, in the official dumb over and, the last couple of years and months. And then today we even talked about it. Abundant the reserves big one. Me, may the big one. be sufficient to prevent severe global systemic liquidity shocks. That was in the, the meeting minutes from April. The Federal Reserve said, hmm, you know, maybe these reserves aren't all they're cracked up to be. But, there's, so, you know, there's still a lot of dots to connect. There's still a lot of dots to say, okay, there's a couple things wrong in the current system to, to then say, well, maybe the current system really doesn't work well at all. And it's such a big shock when you come from the conventional world to think that, oh, central banks aren't central. There's this euro dollar system. It's broken down and it has for the last 13 years. Quantitative easing is not money printing. It's dollars not going to crash, all these other things. It's a huge leap to go from one to the other. And you can understand in one sense why it has taken so much time. And I think where crypto and digital currencies have been ahead of the game is in understanding the fallout from those things and saying, look, we need to do something else because the current system obviously isn't working because look at the central bankers going crazy about all of the things that they do. So that, that gets me to a question, <clears throat> kind of a two-part question. One is, you know, the Fed, I would contend, I think we are all in agreement that the Fed isn't really a central bank. And so, and that's why I go back to that question of, a, a U.S. digital dollar, a CBDC, central bank digital currency, that comes from the Fed would be one thing, from the Treasury would be a completely different thing. And so my worry is that the Fed, for the first time, really can push currency units out into society in real time with rules. And then you could have real-time chaotic stimulus you know, one second after old man Powell wakes up and just decides at 3 a.m. that it's time for a little it's time for a little push and say the used car market or or whatever. And so I worry that, you know, we can say, yeah, you know, bank reserves, you can't buy burgers with bank reserves, but you may be able to buy burgers with a CBDC that the Fed has control over. That's my worry. And that's why I think that a Fed managed currency versus a treasury managed currency are two different animals. What do you think about that? I think in one sense that's right, but I still think that it, 
in any type of realistic option, it's going to be a joint program because it goes back. These people really believe that this digital currency needs to be a liability somewhere. And that's what I mean, I, as I talked about in the article I wrote, that that's really the the uh, that was the for millennia, the interest in gold, because it was a near a zero liability asset. You own gold. There's no liability attached to it. You own it. You own it free and clear. It's not somebody else's you know, currency. It's not somebody else's responsibility. Whereas, you know, to a central banker and a treasury official in, in the 21st century, they can't imagine something like that. What do you mean? It's not, not that's outside of our control. And so in some way, it has to be tied to a, a liability somewhere. And it makes the most sense to, 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 to make it all tied back to a central bank liability, which even if it's issued by the treasury, it's probably going to be a central bank liability, which means that there has to be central bank assets existing in order for there to liability to be backing that digital currency. And so there's always going to be some kind of constraint on the operation of that, that format where digital currency or whatever it is, is a central bank liability, which means that they're not going to be able to just wake up tomorrow and say, we're going to increase the money supply a million times because that's what we think we're going to do. There's always going to be that bureaucratic rules. There's always going to be those friction, operational frictions involved, which I would argue is precisely the problem. That's the problem we need to solve. We need to get outside of their framework and into a, uh, into a more real, realistic assessment, not just of how things are done, but what the, this global economy actually needs. It doesn't need you know, various national central banks sprinkled all over the landscape trying to do different things at different times. I'm still here, Nick. As am I. Okay, Jeff's back. No, all right. Oh, there he is. He's back. So yeah, I, I lost you guys there for a minute. So I so I have another kind of a follow on question to that, Jeff. Can you give people just a brief explanation of open market operations? Because that's not direct. It's not the QE that most people I hope think about is these bank reserves that are put on balance sheets of banks to offset the treasury function and, and to maintain that warehousing system that they believe is so wonderful and that they believe creates all this liquidity and da da da. But but open market operations are actually a dude at a desk making purchases in the market. Is that correct? Yeah, there's an open market desk in New York at the Federal Reserve Bank of, of New York, the branch in on Wall Street, on Liberty Street, sorry. And what the what an open market, there's actually two different kinds of open market operations. There's temporary market, open market operations and there's permanent. So there's TOMOs and POMOs. And the temporary open market operations were before 2008, essentially just the Fed trying to tweak the federal funds rate making sure the federal funds rate never moved too far away from its target. And so they would buy bonds or they would sell treasuries in, in their solar portfolio just a little bit at a time to make sure that there was sufficient reserves, at least. I mean, there was no, there's no precise one-to-one -one relationship. They were sort of winging it. If, you know, the federal funds rate, for example, started, the, the effective rate started to go a little bit high versus the target, the Fed would buy bonds and issue reserves. And so they would try to bring bring the, uh, the federal funds target back down on the theory that these additional reserves that banks had, they would lend them out in the federal funds market. And by and large, that was the case. And so the Federal Reserve under the temporary open market operation procedures before the 2008 crisis didn't need to have a whole lot of open market operations nor a huge amount of treasuries in its portfolio. So they were very, or excuse me, they didn't have to have a lot of, of bank reserves. They had lots of treasuries, but they didn't have many bank reserves because they were sort of so, sort of tweaking a system that was working on its own. And that was really the, the big mistake I think most people we were taught to make, which was that the Fed was at the center of everything, keeping everything under control, when in fact, it was actually the system itself operating at its, at its best. Now, permanent open market operations, which are quantitative e I have to take over at this point. <laughs> you don't want to hear me describe permanent open market operations. Quantitative no, it's, it's, I think it's the universe saying enough of this QE stuff where <laughs> we've had enough. Or it's, you know, maybe there's Chinese censors out there. But no, permanent op open market operations are simply where the Fed intends to buy bonds and hold them and create reserves that, that stick around for obviously per the, name, the name permanent. So in that situation, the Fed buys a bond from a bank and creates the offsetting level of bank reserves, whatever the par value of the bonds. And that that level of bank reserves isn't going to be sterilized or drained at any time or any any point uh, during the the uh, permanent open market operation period. But all of those are done with bank reserves, right? Not U.S. currency units. 
No, there is no year. This is all this is all ledger accounting. So there's so is, you know, even yeah. the bonds aren't really physical bonds either. It's all it's all digital electronic accounting. So this is something that I think a lot of people miss because you hear a lot of these idiot talking heads, and the first thing they go to is, well, open market operations. That's how the <laughs> Fed puts currency units into society. <laughs> no, but it's never been that way. It's never. It, that's I think, you know, again, it's one of those huge leaps because you're taught from day one. You know, Emil and I talked about this on the 20th anniversary of quantitative easing, how the media writes up quantitative easing, pouring trillions of dollars or yen directly into the economy. That's how it's written up. And it's none of it is true. Not a single part of that statement is true. The Fed is there's no currency units. These are bank reserves. And as, as Emil always points out, they're like laundromat tokens. They have a very narrow use. And number two, they don't go anywhere. It's, if the banks don't do anything in response to having bank reserves, because they're thinking, well, I have these useless bank reserves that doesn't really make a difference to me, then it's not pouring anything anywhere. There's nothing going in the real economy because it's it's not real money. And it's up to banks to do things uh, that presumably are in uh, response to having more bank reserves. So does the Fed really backstop these banks then other than with coupons? Is there is there any real liquidity provisions that the Fed does to protect these banks from insolvency? From insol No, I mean, it, it's really all about psychology. It's really all about marketplace psychology. You think about the corporate bond rescue last year when the Fed said it's going to support the corporate bond market no matter what. They didn't buy that many bonds. They didn't go in the market and say, we're, 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 we're making sure the corporate bond market, the junk bond market is flush with cash. They didn't do anything like that. They took six or seven weeks to come up with a list of corporate bonds that they would buy that were you know, in consultation with BlackRock, of course. And then eventually they started buying a couple billion here or there. They weren't supporting the market so much as they were making everyone believe they were supporting the market. And that's really were, what happens. Were those direct purchases in the market or did they purchase those again? Were those swaps with banks that had those assets? No, and that I think they, they were both. There was a mixture of swapping with assets with banks as well as direct purchases in the marketplace. And that included ETFs and other things like that. But there was just there was just a pittance. There was really nothing involved. I mean, there's nothing to it. And the idea that they're supposed to, you know, the rest of us are supposed to take from that is that. Oh, if push comes to shove, these guys will make they'll they'll increase their purchases and make sure that the corporate markets continue to function. <laughs> Emil's silky soft voice. I'm the Jared Kushner of uh, YouTube, macroeconomic <laughs> YouTube, trying to solve the Middle East peace process. Yeah. So okay, so then let's think. Let's say we fast forward 18 months from now, and there is a digital dollar that the Fed can use, how would the repo rumble have looked that night if the Fed had real currency units? Would it have, would it have changed things? No, not at all. <laughs> it doesn't. I mean, if the, if the problem is on the collateral side, then it doesn't matter about reserves or any, any fictional form of funding on the cash side. And I think that's really the biggest point when we talk about repo. Everybody always focuses on the reserve side, which is, again, going back to what Emil and I were just talking about with this FOMC statement from last month where they say, well, there's potential problems in U.S. Treasury repo that spills over from time to time, despite the fact that there are abundant reserves. And so it doesn't matter if the, if the reserves are digital as they are now or some form of CBDC during, in the future. It doesn't solve the collateral problem. So let me ask you this then with with. Because this is what I'm trying to get at is, does the transition from bank reserves that are essentially these coupons, these this you know cutesy money, um, does that does the efficacy of the Fed change when they are using real digital currency units that are interchangeable in society? For instance, that they could like go reserve direct, notes. <laughs> right, well, right, right. Like like if they can no, go direct, they're, directly they're, to the public. I mean, that's what a Federal Reserve note is. It's a non-digital currency that is out there in society circulating on its own. And what we're really talking about with, a, with this digital dollar is that it would replicate the same features of physical Federal Reserve notes. And therefore, it's I mean, it's really no different than physical currency, which is by and large used not used very often to to settle hand to hand transactions. So, but that's what I'm trying to get at. I guess is that what happens when they can go directly to to Joe Sixpack? 
So when it's no longer just funny money from the Fed, it's digital money that Joe Sixpack can go use to buy a six pack. So you mean sort of like what the Treasury has done over the last year? Right. But what happens when now, you, think, when now you have a Treasury and a Fed that can do it? Well, Jeff, I think the Treasury does it iteratively. No, not iteratively. Occasionally. I think Nick is looking towards a future where it may be continuous. Yeah, but how? I mean, that's the point. How? How is the Fed going to conduct monetary policy paying people? That's that's a different that's a different animal. That's, well, if, that's if, another if, world we have to. So, so think about it. If people as a cohort have these digital wallets, then doesn't every single American out there essentially become a tiny uh, party bank to the Fed, like a like a broker? Yeah, but what is what is the asset you're going to swap for the digital currencies? Well, there may there may be no swap. It could be it could be an IOU. The right? Fed cannot pay you just to pay you. But just that it, it, that's that's outside of where he that would be a, a complete reconstruction of the central bank as it is. The Fed isn't like going to issue digital currency just because it wants to issue, issue digital currency. Whereas the Treasury is paying people because it's it's legally uh, presuming that it's a, a tax rebate. So there has to be a legal reason for the Fed to do it. It can't just issue currency to anybody. That was always the problem with Milton Friedman's helicopter to begin with. The Fed can't just print money and then just drop it from a helicopter. That's, that's outside of its, its statutory limits. So if you if are we talking about redesigning a central bank and you just issue currency willy-nilly to everybody at the same time? Well, I'm saying that these SPOs gave me a little look into what could happen when you just don't feel like following the law. <laughs> yeah, well, the Fed has never felt like following the law. Although they would say, look, 13.3 gives them leeway to do pretty much whatever the hell they want. They just declare an emergency and it's it's open season to, to there's, there are no limits. But yeah, I mean, no, I mean, just functionally, a central bank can't just create currency, then put it in your bank account and say, look, you can now spend this however you want using your debit card. There has to be an offsetting transaction. That's why I, I was saying and originally, because this digital currency is going to be a liability of the Fed, there has to be an asset offsetting it to create it. That's why, you know, in quantitative easing, it's an asset swap. Banks have assets that they swap for, for the bank reserves as, as the monetary component. So if you're going to recreate that in, in, instead of using banks where every individual citizen becomes their own QE conduit, well, no, that's, it doesn't work that way. How is the Fed going to create the asset swap that allows this currency to get in people's hands and offset the transaction on its own balance sheet. It has to create the asset. It has to acquire the asset to create the currency. Could they create an equity out of future prosperity? <laughs> now you're talking Enron. <laughs> 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 no, and I, we talk about Enron all the time because you know, as, as much of it is, it was a joke. All Enron did was adopt financial accounting for a, a non-financial firm. It's present value accounting, which in a in a new industry or, you, you know, as they did at the end, making up this broadband marketplace, you know, if you just make up an industry, you can assign whatever future value you want and make it a financial asset out of it. That, that was really all Enron did was it, it used present value gain on sale accounting to make, you know, ridiculous estimates of future, future values of assets. And then the, what is the present value today and put them on their balance sheet as, as if they're real. And so, there's, I mean, that's what banks already do. It has, it hasn't, it hasn't been as uh, out of control as it was before 2008. But that's really the secret behind the modern financial system. It's, it's all balance sheet fictions. Nick, pursuing this further, could we find out what China did? That was raised in the comments section right now by Antonio. Where didn't they do some sort of central bank digital currency tests in a? They've been doing in a an lot isolated of tests. area, and so how did they issue currency to people? Did they ask for something back? No, they actually just created they they created these wallets that people could download, and they just spit money onto these accounts uh, for them to go out and spend in certain places in the economy, and and kind of track the currency and see how it floats around. and And I think a big asterisk behind what China's doing is. They're trying to track currency flight and, and capital escape, and I think sure. that's always been this big thing on their mind because it's a big thing already before digital currency. And if they want this to be a 
currency that gets out to the entire planet. Cause I think China's obviously thinking of Africa. Um, because they're doing a lot of – anyway, long story short, I think that they're they're looking at this. So they're doing a lot of testing, and I think they're just – they're watching the currency bounce around. But that was a direct airdrop. But again, but probably the PBOC – the, Well, the PBOC is more – from the PBOC more, then. It must well, have been from, from the, the from the entity finance testing industry. the digital currency, yeah. I don't know. I don't know the the entity that's actually distributing the currency, but it's, it's who's in charge of the – digital currency for electronic the DCEP in China has been doing a lot of these airdrops in these areas. I think they got 20 or 30 cities now on board that are testing this currency as it floats around. Um, but those are not massive, like everyone in the country kind of airdrops and expatriate airdrops and things like that. Those are just, I mean, this is just kind of like bay testing is the way I understood it. Yeah. It's a small pilot program. Now, let me ask you this. If, if, when the U.S. digital currency be, is created into existence, does the Fed then become an actual central bank? Oh, it could. Theoretically, assume, assuming the digital currency is actually adopted and useful, I'm dubious and skeptical, <laughs> but yeah. you know, that's, that's possible. Does this dovetail with that article that you wrote about ghost money and how – this money, the, the cryptocurrencies are trying to fill in a, a vacuum that's been, been left behind by the, uh, what did you call it? The great Euro dollar famine. Famine. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you wanted to tell the, uh, the audience about this because I never heard of the great bullion famine of the 15th century and how ghost money came into being back then. And then maybe now that's what's happening now with crypto trying to, fill in the vacuum of the euro dollar famine yeah i think that's you know and a lot i guess we said in a lot of ways digital currencies aren't new it's a, the process the idea the, all this ledger stuff digital virtual stuff is something that's there's a, a long a lengthy history behind it and there was there was something called the great bullion famine in the 14th and 15th century where in europe at least there was a severe shortage of hard money. And there's, there's various theories still today about how, how and why that was. Um, some people say it was a balance of payment issue where after the great uh, after the great death, the Black Plague in, in Europe in the 14th century killed off a lot of skilled craftsmen, especially in the towns of Europe. Um, what developed was a, a, a an inability to trade with the East, especially China, where China would send replaceable goods to Europe and Europe only had hard currency to send back to China, which eventually drained Europe of all the hard currency. And as soon as you have that kind of monetary deflation, of course, prices go out of balance. And then even more currency is then stored as, you know, artwork and all sorts of other things, you know, uh, expensive luxury goods. And it just makes everything more, more and more expensive, uh, it, 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 the monetary uh, uh, element to it. So that led, of course, to Christopher Columbus looking for another way to get money back from, from India, as well as you know all the Spanish explorers looking for cities of gold across the Americas. But by and large, there was a monetary shortage throughout Europe in the 14th and 15th century. And in many places, the way they dealt with that was through virtual currencies. Essentially, hmm. merchants in the same region or town would get together and they would, they would produce essentially a common ledger. Okay, you're selling apples, the other guy's selling pigs. How do we value apples versus pigs and who owes what and all that? And it's just per paper virtual money that, att that attempted to offset this inelasticity and hard money. And it really was essentially what I think, you know, to me, it's, 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 a, it's a very similar to what's going on in digital currency. And I call it the great euro dollar famine since 2008 because it's you know to me it's very clearly a monetary shortage and here we have the same kind of idea how do we get some you know any elasticity that's quasi money outside of the official realm that's really all to me that's all really what digital currencies are attempting to accomplish is something as old as you know 15th century bullion famine so it's almost like you're going back to some mixture between ledgers and digital barter right so we're going backwards to go forward kind of because yeah, and it's how do we do barter where we don't have, I mean, we, we don't have the money to actually do the physical exchange because it's in short supply, but we don't want, I mean, we have to have a unit of account and a medium of exchange. Forget store value. And that's really, to me, what's the, what's the, most, uh, what's the most interesting part of the uh, historical example is that 
And during these times, money becomes mostly unit of account and medium of exchange, and nobody cares about the store of value. And that's really what the ghost money was about. The store of value and that all these other two functions come from, well, we'll use a mythical coin that doesn't exist anymore. You know, a pound of Flemish sterling, for example, or a pound of British sterling. It didn't exist as an actual coin, but as a, a ledger piece of paper, you could say, this is our fictional unit of account. We'll, do, we'll divide everything as a, a pure sterling pound of silver. And that way we can, we can measure what the value of apples versus pigs are gonna be. And then we can keep track of who owes what at the end of the day. And it's a very elegant form of elasticity where money is in short supply. And in many ways, the euro dollar system itself was arose out of the same types of characteristics. You had a, you had a, a short supply of gold bullion in the early Bretton Woods system, despite the fact that there was a tremendous global demand for money and a more intricately connected globalized system. And along comes, again, a form of ghost money, a ledger form of, you know, a form of ledger money where we don't actually have, you know, physical cash or, or uh, certainly not gold bullion. Instead, we're going to keep track of store of value, not store of value, but the uh, medium of exchange and unit of account in these quasi official euro, euro dollars. They're essentially this offshore, non official ledger system, virtual system. And since 2008, I don't think it's any, any coincidence that digital currencies have flourished and proliferated, as we talked about, because there's this need for them. And in many ways, it's, the, it's a natural human historical response to this type of situation. So it's almost like these currencies could be they can be spun up to solve a reference problem with a variety of assets and then they can just disintegrate yep. when the problem is abated and then you can go back to more traditional store of value uh you know medium of exchange unit of account type currencies that might have a more global perspective but you could have like for instance a regional problem in sub-saharan africa you could spin up a currency for a short period of time to resolve these little issues these these kind of pain points, and then you could just dissolve the currency once the issue is kind of abated. Yeah, and that's I think that's the major difference then versus now is those were small scale regional uh, regional issues to or regional responses to what was a, a systemic issue, and so you had these yes as you pointed out there's you know small scale testing of this virtual ghost money ledger currency, and if it you know if it ran its course it just disappeared nobody cared it it, it didn't matter because all that mattered was commerce. We do business. We're trying to make business as efficient as possible. The difference today is these digital currencies are being undertaken under much, much, much wider scale. And that's why they're, they're more threatening in some ways to the official, the, the, the current way of doing things. So that was kind of an interesting question. Um, uh, Demayan asks, isn't that how Nigeria uh, or Iran use cryptocurrency? Can't get enough dollars, yep. so they use something else, Bitcoin. So, so this is kind of an example of, of what you're talking about. Absolutely. And it's again, it's, it's a very simple yet elegant solution. And again, it's human nature. We want to do business. We want to trade. And we're not going to allow money shortages to prevent us from doing business. We're going to find a way to do business is really what it comes down to. And because, you know, think about it in the context of capitalism. Capital isn't money. Capital is flourishing businesses. And that's what really matters. That's what really supposed to matter. And money is simply a tool that allows us to, to accomplish those things. And if we don't have enough tools, then well, let's get some more tools. Let's create new ones. And I think that's really the applicable, the, the example here is that historically speaking, this is what happens. You have a monetary shortage. The system which doesn't like a monetary shortage creates the vacuum, which allows for these individual small scale well, private versions of quasi currency to fill in what's essentially a very simple elasticity gap the same was being done before trump was in office with iran when they were using gold just like they are now with crypto and i remember because i'm in the gold business i remember reading articles about the triangle between turkey dubai and iran of gold being funneled through there to just as Jeff explained, to somehow conduct business, if the yeah, dollar it doesn't, is not available, it doesn't matter what it is, right? As long as the parties who are involved in that that currency, the quasi currency, agree, it doesn't matter what it is. It can be anything. It could be gold. It could be digital. It could be pieces of paper. It could be anything. And that's you Remembrance. know that's all money. Money really is all about trust and faith. 
And if you're doing businesses, if you're doing biz, if you're doing monetary, you know, this type of ghost money situation with people you know and trust, it's really easy. And I think that's where digital currencies are going right because they make it a lot of e it might get easy to have that trust and faith across a much bigger scale because you're depending upon essentially complex mathematics that are objective. So does this introduce? It's almost like Emil and Jeff, you guys have. You guys have now introduced a new kind of currency, this impermanent currency, where you could have an impermanent currency solve a, a problem and then gone and then move on to the next problem. So maybe there should be a class of currency that is this impermanent currency since most currencies over time, well, all of them are impermanent, right? We just don't like to admit that. Um, and maybe the U.S. dollar is at some point an impermanent currency. I mean, everybody would have you believe that's going to be by the end of the summer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's we'll be we'll be we'll be weighing on a butcher scale, you know, a hundred dollar bills to buy bananas. But but if we don't have something like that, there is the idea that that there could be very specific purpose built impermanent currencies to go Absolutely. and solve a problem. Yeah, layered currencies that have specific tasks, and they they you know, in a in a. Um, frictionless environment which is you know not it's not not a realistic possible uh, option but in a frictionless environment that could be you know even an elegant solution in and of itself the idea that currencies pop in and, and disappear i think what for that to happen though we have to get people out of the mindset where they equate money with wealth and they think oh the currency disappears that's a horrible thing well no maybe it is maybe it is it currency is a tool it's not the, it's not the object itself it's supposed to be able to grease the wheels of commerce and if a better grease comes along, you should use that one, and you shouldn't you shouldn't fear using a different currency. So that I mean, there's there's a whole you know there's a whole big leap there in terms of getting people's mindset around how currencies used to behave, which is as you point out, Nick, much less permanent, much less permanent basis. So then I got to ask you guys both the burning question because I, your last episode was amazing. I believe it was episode seventy seven. And you guys, I love it when you do the the laundry list of topics and you kind of go through and, and Jeff, you just kind of respond and then Emil eggs you on. And uh, one of the interesting things that, that keeps coming up is inflation, inflation. It's all, you know, the U.S. dollar is going down the toilet and all this kind of stuff. And every, it's big, 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 big. And you guys went, you know, ad nauseum into why this is, you know, don't kind of buy into the bumper sticker right now. Let's, let's give it a little time and see, you know, uh, are these – you know, transitory effects and otherwise. But what is your guess longer term? Um, do we do we see any kind of slow, prolonged increase in consumer and asset prices? Do do will we actually see inflation that everybody's talking about, or is this much ado about nothing? Well, I my opinion is that look, we have a ceiling. And that is, it, we're never going to get above this reflation, these modest reflationary periods that everybody's going to mischaracterize as, oh, this is the inflation breakout, because we're not, we're not really addressing the underlying issues. There's a background here that's relevant to not just inflation, but real economic growth too. And it's worldwide, it's a worldwide problem. So, and as long as we have this broken monetary system, there's no way to get into that sustained inflationary environment because it's always going to be transitory. There's a, there's like a ceiling or a lid or however you want. To, there's a, there's a permanent drag on growth. There's always going to be too much of a, of too much of a, a limitation or constraint for actual sustained broad-based consumer prices to increase. I'm reading a dystopian novel right now. So maybe this is where I'm coming from, but I'm worried about a future where the, the inflation is not too high, but the government comes in and implements regulations, laws to put the rates of return below inflation to make real return negative so as to burn off all that debt. Because I feel we haven't been able to reduce the debt levels. They've only been increasing the private debt levels, especially. And I'm concerned that they're going to implement policies that we saw after the Second World War, where it was just wholesale capital controls to keep returns below inflation. And so even if we don't have high inflation, I'm worried about that future. And then the we will have a permanent money and there'll be calories for food. <laughs> that, that's straight out of my Wow, mouth. you're going that's way, you're going out way out. toward the dark side there. Yeah, that is dark. That is okay. So that maybe not that, but uh 
Yeah, but for that, to, for that to be a realistic is... option, wouldn't governments have to stop and say, oh, debt's a problem? <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure if there's anybody in any government anywhere who thinks that right now. Private debt is the real oh, okay. problem. I, I still believe. don't think that's the case either. Officials don't, don't see debt as the enemy. I, I don't I really care at all, do they? I mean, on, if we're honest, if we shook Jerome Powell at 3 a.m., he doesn't care at all about no. any kind of national debt clock or anything like this. No, it's, it's not on their radar. Not public debt. But you know who does care? The people who are sick of the economy not doing very well. And so we will vote in people that do care, people with plans, people with solutions, even if they are crazy. So that's the problem that Jeff often writes about is the longer this economic depression, the silent depression, this emergency goes on and the people at the top say, meh, we will put in power people that will uh, pursue radical policies. We won't like yeah, it. The rate of change in economic growth goes down. The rate of change on politics and social conditions goes way up. And the problem with that, though, is uh, you're risking, yes, we might, we might vote in people who have legitimate and, and thoughtful solutions, but uh, more likely than not, history has shown we end up voting for people who have just radical theories and want to just create chaos and anarchy. Or you want to commit some sort of vengeance. Everybody mm. likes the idea of an Andrew Yang until they read what Andrew Yang is. And they're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Maybe maybe this is too much. Maybe we'd rather have the, the bad that we know versus the insane that we don't quite yet understand. Yeah, and it's always a delicate breaking point, right? Where does that where does that boundary get reached where things are just unchangeably bad and unworkable today? Yes, the lights are on and people are working and you know there's there's at least a minimum level of competence and growth and all those other things. But eventually where do we say, all right, screw this, it's not getting any better. Let's let let's try something truly radical and different. Let's embrace MMT or naked socialism as they have in some places around the world already. All right. Final question of the of the day. Emil, in months, how long for the US digital currency shows up in a bank account near you? 69. <laughs> I know where your head's at, sir. <laughs> okay, fine. Don't con 96 then. You can't say I'm being lewd or that's an innuendo. 96. <laughs> Between Jeff, you, 69 and 96. What do you think? I don't think they ever come up with one. What I don't about think, Europe? I think the answer Jeff, is zero. Working on it. They, they can you work on it all they want. I don't think they'll ever actually successfully launch a central bank digital currency. The ECB. Christine Lagarde said she's going to do it within four years. You're telling sure. me you don't believe Christine Lagarde. Her I don't believe. Record, I, her how is she record, not in jail? Her body of Never work, mind. Yeah, in, me. In four, I mean, the fact that she's saying it's going to take her four years to develop a digital currency. I mean, what is the digital space going to look like four years from now? It's going to look like nothing that Christine Lagarde comes up with. And that's why I'm saying they are so far behind. And their rate of innovation and change and catching up is less than the private market, which is already exponentially moving forward. So four years from now, when they're ready to launch a digital currency, everybody will be laughing at them. Like, wait a minute. That would have been nice in 2013 or 2014. That would have been cutting edge in 2012. And we're in 2022, 23. So I don't, I don't think digital currencies... They're just not suited to keep up with what's going on. And I don't think any of them ever successfully launch. I'm going to be outside the pilot programs and things like that. They'll put out press releases saying we're doing this and it's working and it's awesome. And But it, I don't think it ever actually goes, goes anywhere. Nick, forgive me. It's your show. Jeff, what about China, though? That, what about <laughs> Well, I mean, they, they – I put them it. on the same same boat. The only difference with the Chinese is they have the the – the leverage of the communist authorities who can say we're doing this, whether it works or not. Well, that's yeah. But that okay. to me, that's not the same thing. Nick. So my friend. guess, I'm going to be the contrarian here. Um, I think in the next 18 months, there Crazy. is, there is a stable coin issued in a, in, in, t on a, in a relative test environment for things like unemployment benefits, you know, for a few tiers of payments, I believe there will be an active U.S. dollar stablecoin, and then I also believe there will be a huge crackdown on other 
stable coins that are issued by these companies, yeah. these fly by night shacks, because the government wants to be the counterfeiter of last resort. That I can, that part I can definitely agree with because the, the government is the more digital currencies do, the more, more technology and promise they show, the more that uh, officials and central bankers and treasury officials or finance ministry officials are going to want to crack down on them. And they'll use every, every bad example as, Oh, this is the reason it's you're stealing pennies from grandmas. You know, this is a scam or, well, yeah, maybe this one was a scam, but that doesn't mean they're all a scam, but that's what they're going to do. They're going to paint crypto with a very negative light. They already tried that once with Bitcoin saying this is, Oh, this is a currency only for illicit drug deals and things like that. They'll, they'll, they'll definitely try to do, to try that angle repeatedly. But again, here is going back to Paul Krugman. Here we are. Everything they've thrown at digital so far hasn't been able to stop it because there's both a need for it and there is value and worth in the in the uh, in the enterprise. Beautiful statement. Good way. <laughs> Emil, Good final, way thoughts. final thoughts. Final oh, thoughts, Emil. I, I can't top that. What Jeff said, that was lovely and hopeful. Uh, just that basically Jeff and I do a show, a regular show, weekly show. You can see it on YouTube at Alhambra Investments channel. You can find it on my YouTube channel. And we're also on Twitter at Emil Kalinowski and at Jeff Snyder underscore AIP. And we talk about the monetary order and the economy and some of the things that we talked about here on this show today. I'm going to be honest. I am a little bit heartbroken that <laughs> uh, I didn't get a call from the, uh, the office of Emil Kalinowski uh, asking me to be on Making Sense. And But you know what? I'll, I've suffered a lot of emotional <laughs> arrows into the chest in my life. I'm going to get past this. Uh, no, you guys are awesome. Um, I love the show. It's, it, it really is required viewing for anybody that wants to understand how bloated this, the macroeconomic space is and how the gears turn. If you don't understand the machinations of money, you'll never get it. Nothing will make sense because you don't know how the gears turn. And if you want it to make sense, Making sense. What? <laughs> yeah. That just happened. I don't have a I don't have a card here. I don't have anything to read. Okay. That just happened. That was natural. It was an organic pitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeff, that's, you know, Nick, that's why we haven't had you on making sense. I haven't told him Emil yet, but I think we're, I'm just gonna audition you to replace him. Maybe that's the that's instead exact, of exact Jeff, you see, that's, I think that's what he was afraid of, and he on. didn't want to bring you on. That's ex you <laughs> did say. Nick, no joke. Jeff wanted to invite you on several times. And I said, sure, let me just file it here because I don't want you to replace me. Yeah. Next Someone month, why don't you do this? Next month you come on the come on the, the show. Well, you guys, you guys are always um, more than welcome. And I like having these these dialogues because I think it's important that people see um, residents of the macroeconomic space that understand the euro dollar system and their view on the crypto space because it, for a while it's going to be crypto and it'll be new and it'll be cool. And then eventually it'll just be finance again. And this will just be another asset class buried within all of these financial kind of sectors and it, and it'll just be part of finance. So I'm very interested to see how all of that forms and your guys' opinion is actually incredibly important. So thank you guys for making the time to come hang out with us and shower us with a wealth a dirge of knowledge and uh and it's uh it's been a lot of fun um you guys do making sense each week normally yes and you're on episode 78 is that right that's right we just recorded it awesome looking forward to it thank you so much uh what does it say good night and good luck is that the uh <laughs> I'm still working that on sounds a little outro. extreme, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Missiles are flying. Good luck, guys. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And we will do this very soon. Okay.